The Collectivist Dogma by Ludwig von Mises This article is excerpted from Theory and History and narrated by John Pruden. Modern collectivist philosophy is a coarse offshoot of the old doctrine of conceptual realism. It has severed itself from the general philosophical antagonism between realism and nominalism and hardly pays any attention to the continued conflict of the two schools. It is a political doctrine, and as such employs a terminology that is seemingly different from that used in the scholastic debates concerning universals, as well as from that of contemporary neo-realism. But the nucleus of its teachings does not differ from that of the medieval realists. It ascribes to the universals objective real existence, even an existence superior to that of individuals, sometimes even flatly denying the autonomous existence of individuals, the only real existence. What distinguishes collectivism from conceptual realism, as taught by philosophers, is not the method of approach, but the political tendencies implied. Collectivism transforms the epistemological doctrine into an ethical claim. It tells people what they ought to do. It distinguishes between the true collective entity to which people owe loyalty and spurious pseudo-entities about which they ought not to bother at all. There is no uniform collectivist ideology, but many collectivist doctrines. Each of them extols a different collectivist entity and requests all decent people to submit to it. Each sect worships its own idol and is intolerant of all rival idols. Each ordains total subjection of the individual. Each is totalitarian. The particularist character of the various collectivist doctrines could easily be ignored because they regularly start with the opposition between society in general and individuals. In this antithesis, there appears only one collective comprehending all individuals. There cannot therefore arise any rivalry among a multitude of collective entities. But in the further course of the analysis, a special collective is imperceptibly substituted for the comprehensive image of the unique great society. Let us first examine the concept of society in general. Men cooperate with one another. The totality of interhuman relations engendered by such cooperation is called society. Society is not an entity in itself. It is an aspect of human action. It does not exist or live outside of the conduct of people. It is an orientation of human action. Society neither thinks nor acts. Individuals in thinking and acting constitute a complex of relations and facts that are called social relations and facts. The issue has been confused by an arithmetical metaphor. Is society, people asked, merely a sum of individuals, or is it more than this, and thereby an entity endowed with independent reality? The question is nonsensical. Society is neither the sum of individuals, nor more, nor less. Arithmetical concepts cannot be applied to the matter. Another confusion arises from the no less empty question whether society is, in logic and in time, anterior to individuals or not. The evolution of society and that of civilization were not two distinct processes, but one and the same process. The biological passing of a species of primates beyond the level of a mere animal existence and their transformation into primitive men implied already the development of the first rudiments of social cooperation. Homo sapiens appeared on the stage of earthly events neither as a solitary food seeker nor as a member of a gregarious flock, but as a being consciously cooperating with other beings of his own kind. Only in cooperation with his fellows could he develop language, the indispensable tool of thinking. We cannot even imagine a reasonable being living in perfect isolation and not cooperating at least with members of his family, clan, or tribe. Man as man is necessarily a social animal. Some sort of cooperation is an essential characteristic of his nature, but awareness of this fact does not justify dealing with social relations as if they were something else than relations. 
or with society as if it were an independent entity outside or above the actions of individual men. Finally, there are the misconstructions caused by the organismic metaphor. We may compare society to a biological organism. The tertium comparationis is the fact that division of labor and cooperation exist among the various parts of a biological body as among the various members of society. But the biological evolution that resulted in the emergence of the structure function systems of plant and animal bodies was a purely physiological process in which no trace of a conscious activity on the part of the cells can be discovered. On the other hand, human society is an intellectual and spiritual phenomenon. In cooperating with their fellows, individuals do not divest themselves of their individuality. They retain the power to act antisocially and often make use of it. Its place in the structure of the body is invariably assigned to each cell, but individuals spontaneously choose the way in which they integrate themselves into social cooperation. Men have ideas and seek chosen ends, while the cells and organs of the body lack such autonomy. Gestalt psychology passionately rejects the psychological doctrine of associationism. It ridicules the conception of a sensory mosaic which nobody has ever observed and teaches that analysis, if it wants to reveal the universe in its completeness, has to stop at the holes, whatever their size, which possess functional reality. Whatever one may think about Gestalt psychology, it is obvious that it has no reference at all to the problems of society. It is manifest that nobody has ever observed society as a whole. What can be observed is always actions of individuals. In interpreting the various aspects of the individual's actions, the theorists develop the concept of society. There cannot be any question of understanding the properties of parts from the properties of wholes. There are no properties of society that cannot be discovered in the conduct of its members. In contrasting society and the individual, and in denying to the latter any true reality, the collectivist doctrines look upon the individual merely as a refractory rebel. This sinful wretch has the impudence to give preference to his petty selfish interests as against the sublime interests of the great God society. Of course, the collectivist ascribes this eminence only to the rightful social idol, not to one of the pretenders. But who pretender is, and who is king? God bless us all. That's quite another thing. When the collectivist extols the state, what he means is not every state, but only the regime of which he approves, no matter whether this legitimate state exists already or has to be created. For the Czech irredentists in the old Austria and the Irish irredentists in the United Kingdom, the states whose governments resided in Vienna and in London were usurpers. Their rightful state did not yet exist. Especially remarkable is the terminology of the Marxians. Marx was bitterly hostile to the Prussian state of the Hohenzollern, to make it clear that the state which he wanted to see omnipotent and totalitarian was not that state whose rulers resided in Berlin, he called the future state of his program not state, but society. The innovation was merely verbal. For what Marx aimed at was to abolish any sphere of the individual's initiative action by transferring the control of all economic activities to the social apparatus of compulsion and repression which is commonly called state or government. The hoax did not fail to beguile lots of people. Even today, there are still dupes who think that there is a difference between state socialism and other types of socialism. The confusion of the concepts of society and of state originated with Hegel and Schelling. It is customary to distinguish two schools of Hegelians, the left wing and the right wing. The distinction refers only to the attitudes of these authors toward the Kingdom of Prussia and the doctrines of the Prussian Union Church. The political creed of both wings was essentially the same. Both advocated government omnipotence. It was a left-wing Hegelian, Ferdinand LaSalle, who most clearly expressed the fundamental thesis of Hegelianism. The state is God. 
Hegel himself had been a little more cautious. He only declared that it is the course of God through the world that constitutes the state, and that in dealing with the state one must contemplate the idea, God, as actual on earth. The collectivist philosophers fail to realize that what constitutes the state is the actions of individuals. The legislators, those enforcing the laws by force of arms, and those yielding to the dictates of the laws and the police constitute the state by their behavior. In this sense alone is the state real. There is no state apart from such actions of individual men. The Ludwig von Mises Institute hopes you have enjoyed this audio, Mises Daily. For a world of free market literature, media, and discussion, visit Mises.org.